Hello, I am Ellen Steger, president of the League of Women Voters of Richardson. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that never supports or opposes any candidate or political party. If you are interested in joining or donating to the League of Women Voters of Richardson, visit our website at lwvrichardson.org. Membership is open to women and men of all ages. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Richardson for candidates running for Richardson Independent School Board of Trustees at large, place seven. All registered voters living in Richardson ISD are eligible to vote in the place seven election. This forum was recorded via Zoom during the first week in April without an audience. Seven candidates are running for Richardson ISD Board of Trustees, place seven. Two forums are being held to avoid having too many candidates in one forum. This forum is for candidates in ballot positions four through seven. Candidates running for at-large place seven, ballot positions one through three are in another forum. Gavin Haynes, who is running in ballot position six, did not respond to any of our emails or phone calls and is not participating in this forum. More voter information may be found online at vote411.org and our website, lwvrichardson.org. Printed voters guides are now available. See our website for locations. Before we begin, I need to review the format for this forum. All candidates have agreed to abide by some basic ground rules and as moderator, I have agreed to ensure that the ground rules are followed. The candidates will discuss their own position on issues and not dwell on their opponent's record or position, refrain from personal attacks or charges, answer the question that was asked and respect the time limits. The candidates will have one and a half minutes to introduce themselves one and a half minutes to answer each question, and two minutes for a closing statement. Candidates will rotate going first. The public was polled to supply questions for this forum. Requests were made on social media and on the Richardson League's website, as well as through emails. Many thanks to those who submitted questions. However, due to the number of questions submitted and the time limitations of this forum, we are not able to ask all questions submitted. Questions have been screened according to the League of Women Voters of Texas Guide to Candidate Forums. The candidates have no prior knowledge of these questions. The timekeeper for the evening is from the League of Women Voters of Richardson and will be visible on the video at all times. The timekeeper will signal with a green sign when 30 seconds remain, with a yellow sign when 10 seconds remain, and with a red stop sign when time for answering the questions has expired. Candidates, can all of you see the timekeeper? Yes. Uh, the yes. candidates have one and a half minutes to introduce themselves. Introductions will be in ballot order. Um, Eric Stingel, as you are in ballot position four, you will go first. You have one and a half minutes to introduce yourself. Well, uh... Thank you for hosting this, Miss um, Steger and Miss Wren. Uh, we, I do appreciate the League of Women Voters and all that you do for our communities at informing our community about, um, you know, who is running for our very important uh, municipal and school board elections. My name is Eric Stengel, and uh, I'm a native to the area. I pretty much uh, grew up in Richardson as a uh, young boy, having graduated from the system. Uh, I attended uh, basically the feeder patterns of uh, Dartmouth Elementary, Apollo Junior High, and graduated from Berkner High School a long time ago. Um, but, and uh, at one point, I taught school for a little bit. I have 1.25 years of teaching service, as well as uh, a couple of years of substitute teaching experience. I am a graduate of Texas Tech University with a degree in history, and I attended the University of Texas at Dallas a teacher certification program. My daughter attends the local school up the road. I am uh, basically live in Richardson, and the admin building is close, and I thought, what a good way to give back since, uh, you know, 
why not? So I figured public service is the highest form of, um, you know, highest form of service that one can do. And uh, school board seems like a good position. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Christopher J. Petit, you have one and a half minutes for an introduction. Yes, ma'am. Um, I appreciate the opportunity for speaking tonight to uh, the greater audience uh, Monday when it goes out. I'm Chris Poteet. I'm a parent in RSD. I live in the Lake Highlands area. i um, lived there for about 14 years. I have two children, uh, one at Forest Meadow uh, Junior High and one at Moss Haven uh, Elementary. Um, I'm a civil engineer by trade, um, but got there through after nine years in the Army following uh, graduation from Texas A&M. Um, so I spent nine years overseas and, and, and in the United States in the Army serving. Um, I've got a passion for education. I've got a passion for community service. Uh, since I've been in Dallas, I've been very active in RSD with both uh, inside RSD along with the bond committee, uh, steering committee and uh, some other committees within RSD. Um, I was, I'm in the Exchange Club of Lake Highlands. I, that's part of how I'm giving back to the community. And I was the president two years ago of that organization. Um, I participated in Leadership Dallas in 2014, and that kind of opened my eyes to the, uh, the importance of education outside of just my neighborhood, my child. And that kind of sparked the interest. And I've been working on learning the district and, uh, and getting to feel for how I can better give back. And I see the Board of Trustees um, as, as probably the most paramount way to give back to my community and help foster the long-term success of our community by educating our future leaders. I appreciate the opportunity, thank you. Thank you. And Nicholas Frank LaGrasa, you have one and a half minutes for an intro. Good evening, thank you for having me here today. My name is Nicholas LaGrasa. I've lived in the district with my wife since 2018. My wife delivered twins four weeks ago who will be attending Aiken Elementary very soon. I'm running today to make their education better tomorrow. Um, my background is in emergency management with a currently working on a master's in urban planning through the University of Southern California. Um, uh, currently, uh, due to COVID, uh, I'm working as a security guard, um, but I, um, I believe we're all uh, working on getting by the best way we can. My primary campaign goal is to radically reform teacher compensation within the district. Uh, for starters, the area median of income area median income of Richardson is seventy one thousand dollars. That should be the starting salary for any teacher working in the district. Um, in addition to teacher pay, I'm open to discussion on expanding the current family leave policy to one year paid time off at one hundred percent salary. Um, aside from teacher compensation. Um, I support significant changes to vocational opportunity for students not attending college. Bottom line, I'm not the kind of person who runs for these kinds of seats. Uh, I'm the youngest person in this race and one of the youngest persons running for any uh, school board spot in the state. I'm not weighed down by anything. I have no preconceived notions. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you and hopefully your vote as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll start with the questions. Each of you has one and a half minutes to answer each question. Question number one, we'll begin with Mr. Uh, Poteet. What are the top two challenges facing Richardson ISD today and what would you do to address them? So uh, I think the top, one of the top challenges that I'm really focused on is, is culture. And I come from, whether it was in the military or whether it is in business, I come from a place where organizational culture is critical, uh, and I see that that's the same at RSD. We've got a history of a very successful culture, um, and I want to make sure that that history and that reputation is is kept. Um, coming out of COVID, I think is going to be a major challenge that we have as a district, along with every other district in the country. Um, but from the student standpoint and from the teacher standpoint. I think that fostering and building and continuing to build on a culture of success and one where teachers want to, want to teach within the district and stay here for a career and where students learn uh, as the mission is and the vision that we have as a district. I think that enhancing that culture and building on that culture is critical. And I think that it's gonna be very challenged um, as we've seen through the coming out of the COVID environment, especially going into next year. 
Um, that's that's probably the most critical challenge that we that we have, um, aside from keeping our eye on the board goals that we've got over the next few years. And I think that we know how critical the third grade uh, reading and math are to the success of these students in the future. And I think that that'll be a challenge that we need to continue to address. Thank you. Mr. LaGrasa, you have a minute and a half. I would say the two top facing issue or two issues facing Richardson today are number one, the transition back to the classroom from COVID and the second being um, anti-racism action. And in a sense that uh, living in the world uh, that we live today, uh, post uh, George Floyd, living in, the, living in the reality of Black Lives Matter. Um, post COVID, uh, I wanna make sure that, that every teacher has the opportunity to receive a vaccination should they choose to. And if they don't, um, maybe finding a, a, a necessary middle ground um, for, for an individual who, who, for whatever reason, can't or, or chooses not to. Um, making sure that, that every student who has the, uh, has the opportunity to, to learn in the classroom um, does so, or is able to do so with uh, proper guidance, um, is able to make sure that each, each student is safe. Um, Anti-racism action, you know, we live in it, we live in a world um, where minority students uh, don't feel as safe as they used to. And, and that's a shame. And they, and when kids don't feel safe, they don't learn. Um, and if we're doing anything here, it's to make those, is, is to help those kids learn to the best of their abilities. And if we as adults uh, need to change how we do things, how things are done in a class to make those things better, then we shall. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Stengel, you have a minute and a half. Okay. Uh, as part of my day job, I'm a medical staff uh, services professional. So I deal with uh, basically um, an educated workforce where I'm basically I'm in the people management business. And I've thought a lot about uh, this issue facing the district. We're in a, we used to be a suburban district with a certain stu student population. Now we're catering to a very urbanized district with a large contingent of economically disadvantaged students, a lot of English language learners. And Chris, Mr. Poteet had it right on the money. We must build a culture and we have to instill a culture of excellence at each campus. Basically, uh, um, there's that movie, Stand and Deliver, Ghana's, having the desire to change each campus and having a solid communication method to where we can relay the admin administration goals that come out of the various committees and having a clear communication to where we can bring people together, not to where we can divide people. And it's very important to have that because so often we miscommunicate through text messages, through emails, through social media. So we have to instill that good communication method. And so culture and communication. Thank you. For our second question, we'll begin with Mr. LaGrasa. Uh, the question is, are you willing to change school attendance boundaries to address enrollment growth and lack of racial and socioeconomic diversity at our elementary schools? Why or why not? Absolutely. I don't see why not. Um, if we, if whatever, whatever changes need to be, to, meet, to be made to meet any kind of goals need to be on the table. And if that means changing boundaries, yes. In a perfect world, honestly, I'd like to see change or see the concept of of, of school attendance boundaries removed, and each each um, parent deciding which school that they would want to send their child to, um, regardless of of how close or how far it is uh, from from their their house. That's neither here nor there. Um, excuse me. Regardless. Whatever changes need to be made to to meet um, district goals in terms of demographics need to be on the table. We should absolutely be willing to consider modifying um, uh, attendance boundaries and um, making sure that um, we put our kids first and, and not uh, our parental conveniences. Thank you. Mr. Stengel, a minute and a half. Well, that's definitely a concern. Our uh, school district neighbor uh, to the east, Garland ISD, 
They were dinged for uh, not having equitable campuses. However, they kept the choice of school uh, program for their school system. So possibly looking at that in terms of where students go to school, that would certainly help address some of the overcrowding issues. But at the end of the day, parents like to send their kids to the nearest school to where they live. They don't like to put them on a bus if they can help it. So maybe having some sort of equitable choice of school lotto type program might be a good idea. I'm not opposed to such a program, but uh, at the end of the day, we have to look at all the different scenarios because we don't want to bus kids halfway across town and you know have a problem with the parent parents and caregivers. So that's my position on the matter. Thank you. And Mr. Petit, you have a minute and a half. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I, I think one, absolutely, I'm willing to discuss it. Um, I think that there's a lot of facts and a lot of analysis that needs to go into that before you agree to making that kind of change or adopting that kind of change. Uh, there's costs and benefits to any kind of change like that. that that's significant. But I do want to say that I respect that RISD is very innovative and we don't seem as a district to be afraid to look at different options to reach the goals that we've set as a district. So those education goals that we've got, and I know equity is, uh, is, is being woven in and a lens that we're looking through these goals. So it is something that needs to be discussed and how do we achieve those goals? This is, this is an action that I'd be willing to discuss and learn more about. Um, before making that decision. Um, but one thing that, uh, to Eric's point, I think a strength of our district is our community schools, our neighborhood schools. And whether you're in Lake Highlands or North Dallas or City of Richardson or City of Garland, um, you know, a lot of us, we do have, you know, the cradle, the classroom, and then throughout the classroom environment, we appreciate having that neighborhood school, that community school. And for those that we don't have the strength, we need to work on strengthening that same and replicating that at the schools that don't have those neighborhoods that are quite as strong. So I think innovatively, that's something that we're always open to look at is how do we achieve our goals through innovation? And this may be something we're willing to discuss. And I am. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Mr. Stengel, you'll be first with this next question. Should COVID-19 and other vaccinations be required of students, teachers, and staff? Why or why not? That's a very good question. And um, I mean, I'm all for vaccines, you know, for the people that want them and need them. However, we must look at uh, conscientious uh, people, you know, religious exemptions and other matters and, and look at those factors. Um, at the end of the day, one's immunity and the way they build immunity is inherent to, uh, you know, opening safe schools. Now, would I be in favor of everyone receiving the vaccine to where we could get back to normal? Of course I would. Uh, you know, vaccines do work. They've eradicated certain diseases. However, I don't want to walk on that slippery slope of mandating that everybody have to receive a vaccine to attend school. I think we can go about doing it different. And obviously the more people, kids and the, well, I mean, the more adults that we have vaccinated, then the more that we have a good immune response because the data shows that it's the adult population that transmit the virus, not necessarily the kids. So, and of course I would rely on the experts, uh, the, the advice of health experts uh, to the district, as well as the different uh, CDC and uh, Dallas County uh, health uh, objectives. So yes, that's my position. Okay, thank you. Mr. Petit, you have a minute and a half. Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as requiring them, I'm not there yet. And I think there's a lot to learn still. I mean, we're a year into this pandemic. We're what, two or three months into the vaccines. Um, and we've got a lot to learn about the vaccines. Um, and we've got a lot to learn on how, how long they even last. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions out there. But again, I want to kind of go back to the last question as well. I think that the innovation that we're, we've developed a reputation for is something that gives us options. And I think at the end of the day, options is what, what we, is a strength we have for our students and our families that are part of the district. And let's not forget about the teachers as well. 
Um, and so having those options like we have now, we have virtual options right now for people that don't feel comfortable in school or have other reasons, um, um, uh, immune compromised uh, relatives, et cetera, uh, at home. So I think using that innovation and looking at those options going forward is something that we need to consider. Um, but I don't think we're at a point right now where, we, where we're comfortable and have all the facts to require a vaccine for attendance in school. So um, I'm open to discussion, but I think we've got a lot of facts together and a lot of analysis as a country before we get to that point. So that's where I stand. Thank you. And Mr. LaGrasa, you have a minute and a half. I personally firmly believe that every man and woman and once we get their child uh, should receive the COVID vaccination. Um, we looking at the looking at how many people we lost uh, over the past year um, to COVID and COVID-19. Um, I think it's um, it's extremely problematic for, for people to uh, to decide that it is their um, human right to uh, to to infect others. That's neither here nor there. Um, you know, as as uh, for as far as teachers go, um, you know, we have the technology to uh, to let um, let them teach uh, using Zoom, using uh, using the technology that we have that we have available uh, for remote learning. Um, if a teacher doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to take the COVID vaccine, I'm sure we can find a, a, a healthy alternative for for them. If it's continuing teaching in a remote environment, if it's finding um, some other capacity for them to work in um, until this all blows over, then 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 so be it. Uh, same really goes for students. Once there's a once there's a um, pediatric COVID vaccine available, either we either they take the vaccine and they return to school, uh, they or they continue learning in a in a remote environment. Um, those are those are really the the number number one and two options that that we have. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well. Uh, several of you have already uh, touched on our next question, but here goes. Mr. Petit, you'll be the first to answer. How would you recommend the district continue with face-to-face -face and online learning? Please elaborate. Well, I think I answered that. No, I'm joking. We, uh, I, I do think that, um, that there's discussions right now. I know for a fact that there's discussions on long-term plans for virtual. And as part of the steering committee for the bond, I know that the, uh, some of the technology that's included in the bond is to help strengthen that, that infrastructure, that architecture that can make, that, make the access um, a lot stronger for students that choose that. So I think that having that option going forward, um, especially in the short term, which I'm talking like over the next year, I think that's critical to look at. I think that's critical to offer. And I think we realize that currently as a district. And we look at neighboring districts like DISD and they're looking at similar similar uh, type programs. Um, I do believe, honestly, that the best way to, that, t that students are gonna learn is with a teacher and a student in a classroom. Um, but I know that that's not gonna always be the case nor the choice of the parents. So we talk about school choice a lot of times in um, you know, talking about charters and vouchers and other, other hot topics there. But I think this is a choice that based on the environment we've been in over the last year, that we have to we have to address, and I think that uh, that we will have a certain percentage of the population within the district that this would be a good option to make available to them. Thank you, and Mr. Lagrasa, you have a minute and a half. I agree one hundred percent. You know, in in, in today's uh, reality, we have these tools available, and it's kind of a shame that it took this long to implement them in the first place. Um, it, moving forward, if you don't feel comfortable having your uh, child uh, attend school at this time, cool. We should definitely implement Zoom or, or similar technology as quickly as possible. Um, I, I don't see why, why not. Um, if that's what it's gonna take, if that's how best your child learns, let's do what's best for the child. Um, if, you're, if, if you wanna do something, something similar for, for an entire group of kids, let's, and let's implement something like, I believe they called them pods. It was like small, group of, small groups of kids, they all uh, learned uh, the same way. It was kind of like, kind of like a hybrid classroom model. We should definitely do that. We should be looking at all options available to make sure that each child has the opportunity to learn uh, their best way possible. Does the data say that cl in classroom learning is, is the best? Technically, yes, but I believe it's more important that the child um, has the opportunity to feel safe, that the parents feel safe 
uh, that that everybody is has a comfortable uh, is comfortable with the situation at hand. And if that means they they stay home and learn from Zoom, then then I don't see why why we can't do that. Thank you. And Mr. Stengel, you have a minute and a half. Uh, yes, I'm definitely in favor of a hybrid uh, model where, um, you know, basically parents and caregivers can have that option to enroll their kids in a virtual instruction if they so wish. Uh, there's a lot of schools in charter schools and different places that have been doing the virtual school option for a while now. So I don't see why uh, it would be an issue. Um, I would add one caveat, though, however, um, we have to realize that not all parents or caregivers or students are technologically savvy. We have to have a good in-person network call center to make sure that they can address such technological issues such as bandwidth, um, you know, computer, tablet software issues and things of that nature on the front end. So we need to make sure we have that good people infrastructure in place. And we have to make sure that we encourage meaningful technological use because cyber bullying with our middle school and high school students and even elementary students is a real issue. And we have to be cognizant of that. And we also have to look at metadata in the different vendors that we use for the edu the online education. So we have to be aware of all these things. Thank you. For the next question, Mr. LaGrasa, you will start. How would you communicate with a parent who is concerned over a controversial, controversial subject like, for example, banning certain types of library books? What actions would you suggest be taken, if any? You have a minute and a half. As a uh, as a member of the school board, I would follow the um, preferred con continuum in that we direct those kinds of questions firstly to the teacher, if that individual is not satisfied uh, through their uh, through through that answer, um, the principal, and then um, you know uh, moving up from there until uh, I feel it comfortable. That, uh, that they have exhausted all of their options before speaking to me as an elected official whose um, power solely rest, or so, is solely vested in uh, the superintendent as opposed to uh, yeah, working with the day-to-day day, day -day operations of the school. Um, they're not gonna like my answer though, uh, <laughs> just to be frank. Um, but uh, I, if parents want to come to me um, about questions, you know, I'm, I'm bottom line. I'm going to tell them: Have you talked to the teacher? Have you talked to the principal? What's what's the real issue going on that you feel necessary to come to me as your elected official versus working your way up the chain? Um, because I, I I I think it's important that, that parents know that we as as board of trustees we have extremely limited options when it comes to dealing with these kinds of matters. You know, we work primarily through. The superintendent and and if there's something that we can yield to them on that matter we're absolutely going to and and this uh, says just the same thank you thank you mr stengel you have a minute and a half well uh in my academic journey i started off as a philosophy major until i discovered that i was tired of trying to find truth that i could never find so then i switched majors to history so definitely banning books um <laughs> makes my heart hurt. So yeah, I don't think we should ban any books that might be a method of teaching inclusiveness in this to our student population. I do think we need a certain modicum of respect and tolerance to those people that find such books as abhorrent to their personal moral reviews. I do think there needs to be a good system in place of communication to where our campuses let the parents and caregivers know of such you know, resources being available when they teach a certain lesson or they provide a certain book because teachers have to continuously model as well as the home support, they have to continuously model you know, that lesson that they want to teach. And so, yes, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in favor of the banning of books. And of course, I would defer to the superintendent 
on all matters. And uh, I would be cognizant of the Open Meetings Act and other issues uh, before addressing a parent. Thank you. And Mr. Petit, one of hey, the last minutes. Could I ask to repeat the question, please? Yes. How would you communicate with a parent who is concerned over a controversial subject like, for example, banning certain types of library books? What actions would you suggest be taken, if any? Sure. So, so there's, there's quite a few of those types of uh, topics, especially these days, um, and they're all critical. They're all, if they're important to a parent, important to a, a student, then they're important to the district and important to the board. Um, so, so one, I'd say one of our five, as, as people may or may not know, but one of the five roles of the board of trustees and the, the trustee is communication. You're that conduit to those parents, to the constituents um, within the district. So it, it is critical that we're a piece of that. Um, but two, I, I, think, I think that the first task I would have is making sure that I'm communicating to the district and the parents on what the position is and what's happening within the district. Because I feel that sometimes um, when some of these topics are broached from the parents, it's from a lack of communication, a lack of knowledge of what's really going on what the policy is, what the plan is, and how it's executed. So I think that me explaining that in my role as a trustee is the critical first step. Listening, listening's huge. And I think that we've got to do a lot of more listening than we do talking. Um, I do want to follow on with Eric and Nicholas, too, that, you know, using the, the teacher, the administrator at the school, and on up the chain is part of our I think that's a that's a valid response is is using that and making sure the parent has that contact and is working it through that chain as well. Thank you. Okay. You bet. And Mr. Stengel, you'll be first on this next question. What, if any, mental health services should RISD provide to students? And please explain. Well, the the district offers quite a bit of mental health uh, services already. Um, I know they're. NAMI, uh, basically the North uh, Texas Association of Medical, I just had a, a brain lapse. Anyways, they're one of the preferred vendors on, on the site. And then we have a lot of great charities and organizations and mental health support groups. So I think the district is on top of that. Of course, at the end of the day, um, mental health, it doesn't just include the district. The, the people that make up the district it includes you, it includes me, it includes everyone because mental health is something that we all have to address as a community and we have to address it on the forefront when it happens. We can't just rely on, oh, this district employee didn't catch it or this person didn't catch it. We have to be there for others and that, that's how we go about doing it. But we have a lot of great partnerships in the district that we rely on. And uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Petit, you have a minute and a half. Sure. So I, I know for a fact that we've got a pretty, pretty strong counseling service within the district. And that's, that's something that I think is, is critical. Um, but I also, you know, as a, as a bigger, um, as a bigger topic in society, I mean, personally, I think that mental health is something that we, we have a hard time getting our arms around. And it's something that I think has become more critical and more of a need um, within students, parents, and, and citizens. So I do think that this is a strong component. I talked about culture earlier. I talked about the board goals. And for us to reach those goals and foster that, that successful culture that we have, I think that mental health and counseling services is a critical piece. Um, as we, coming out of COVID, I tend to believe that we're gonna to have to really look at strengthening that, building that, having greater support structure in there, um, and not only for the students, but for the benefit of the teachers. Um, quite honestly, and I have not taught, but the teachers being the frontline worker and, and, and uh, for, for the students, they end up having to tackle a lot of the mental health issues up front. And I think that empowering our teachers and giving them some tools is something that's gonna be critical, especially coming out of the, the COVID environment that we've had. We've had a lot of challenges and, and I believe that mental health is, um, is gonna be at the top of the list of priorities that we have to look at as a district. Thank you. And Mr. LaGrasa, you have uh, a minute and a half. 
uh, RISD uh, may have an extremely robust mental health system, uh, but the vast majority of students who need it or will need it uh, won't use it voluntarily. Um, number one, we need to find a way to make sure teachers have the, uh, as, as Chris, Christopher said, uh, to empower teachers uh, to, to you know, flag student, flag may be the wrong word, but uh, to be able to have the um, self-confidence, again, for lack of a better term, um, to, to say to administration, hey, this student needs more help. Um, we, we need to make sure that, that uh, teachers have the opportunity to do that. Secondly, any you know, mental health um, issues re are, appear in, in different ways, and a lot of people uh, miss them for whatever reason. Um, pr most primarily in students, we're going to see that in disciplinary issues. And moving forward, I would support a practice of giving mental health screening to any student who for whatever reason finds himself at the um, alternative education school, uh, the, the uh, making sure that we find the exact root of why uh, they're disruptive to the classroom, why they're, um, why, why they're uh, having these disciplinary issues. And if that is a mental health issue, we, sh we can stop it in its tracks um, and, and using our tools that we have uh, to meet those needs that way. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Petit, you will start us uh, with this next question. Four RISD schools currently have accelerated campus excellence or ACE programs. Among other things, ACE provides free breakfast, lunch, and dinner to all students, after school enrichment programs at no cost, and student culture routines. Should this program be extended to other schools? Why or why not? And if so, which other schools? You have a minute and a half. All right, sure. Um, so I'm familiar with ACE, with the ACE program, and I know that other districts around us, um, namely Dallas, has had success with that. I believe we're, and I may be off a year, but I believe we're in about our third year of implementing the ACE program. And I believe that the feedback, early feedback is positive. Um, it is a commitment. I know getting that commitment from the district um, was tough when it took place because it's resources, right? But I believe the teachers that have been part of that program are benefiting these students. I believe, like you said, the, you know, when I was in Leadership Dallas and they were talking to us about some of the issues in public education, having a, having a child that doesn't eat in the morning, doesn't have food in the morning, and then expecting them to learn throughout the day, um, you're starting from behind zero on that. And so I think these are critical programs where the need is greatest. Um, but I do think that we're a little early and COVID actually, you know, I'm assuming COVID probably hasn't helped us in getting the kind of feedback that we need to know that this is a long-term um, and expandable program at this point. So I'm very open to it. I'm very positive about the program and I'm very open to expanding it. But I think that we're a little premature right now on analyzing the success and then determining how far we want to expand it. So Big fan of it. I think that's another part of the innovation within this uh, within this district to achieve our goals. Um, but I think we've still got some work to do before we decide to, to increase it. Mr. LaGrasa, you have a minute and a half. So not being it technically apparent within the school district, I'm not as familiar with the ACE program as I would like to. Uh, that being said, I, I, I have a cursory knowledge of it and I, I love everything about it, honestly. Um, I think this is a great way to meet the needs of students uh, who, for whatever reason, aren't having their needs met uh, otherwise. Um, I think it's very important that we are the third school district in Texas to do this, uh, right behind Dallas and Fort Worth. I think that speaks volumes for Richardson being an innovator and a leader within the, within, uh, the state of Texas. Um, I would follow in the footsteps of Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, if they're expanding their programs, we should be right behind them and expanding their programs too. Um, Obviously, we need to look at the data uh, post-COVID. We need to make sure that, that we aren't uh, pushing uh, this too fast, too quickly. But I think this is genuinely a step in the right direction. And hopefully, with any luck, um, we will be on track to, uh, to um, you know, be on display for the rest of the, the, the state and, and be a, um, a model of this is how you do it and this is how you do it well. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Stengel, you have a minute and a half. 
Uh, yes, I'm familiar with the ACE uh, model. I did my student teaching in Dallas ISD. I've uh, substitute taught at many of the school districts. So in 2018, they implemented ACE at Bucare, our ISD Academy, Forest Lane, and Thurgood Marshall. Um, does ACE do, I mean, does the data show that ACE works? Of course. My only uh, hesitancy is that ACE is a temporary grant funded program. Uh, oftentimes when ACE is first started, you have a lot of turnover of teachers and paraprofessionals because they aren't sure what the ACE model looks like, unless of course you obtain veteran ACE teachers. I think ACE doesn't go far enough. I think we have quite a bit of schools that could benefit from a good teacher mix of splitting everybody up and, um, you know, maybe looking at how can we look from a budgetary perspective perspective of giving teachers more of an incentive to work in those low socioeconomic and title one schools without using the ACE model. Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, ACE doesn't go far enough, but it does. So, you know, it, it has its benefits and whatnot. So as well as negative side. Thank you, Mr. LaGrasa, you will be first on this next question. The district recently created the Department of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, or EDI, and drafted an equity policy which includes a racial equity component. What changes, if any, are needed to achieve the goal of EDI? Please elaborate. Um, so first off, I, I, uh, I believe it's, it's very important that, that, we've, uh, that we've taken that step and, and implemented an EDI program. Uh, as I've said before, if, if students aren't, don't feel safe, they don't learn. And if they don't learn, what are we doing here? Um, I think it's a little early to say, well, let's start making some changes. I think we need to see um, post COVID that, that the program as designed works, you know, in a couple, in, in two or three years, we can look and see, um, okay, what's, what's, what's not working, what's working really, really well. What do we need to bolster? What do we need to get rid of? Um, we can look at that then. Um, however, right now, um, let's, let's keep it going. Um, let's, once we get back into schools, let's actually, uh, see if, if it works before we, before we start, um, tinkering with it for lack of a better term. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stengel, you have a minute and a half. Well, one of the roles of a board of trustees member is to ensure the creation of a vision and mission and goals for the district. The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee under the uh, auspices of Angie Lee, Jeremy Jewett, Desiree Cantu. I mean, it, it, it's a good, good department to have. Uh, we definitely need to look at our inherent biases in all that we do. We need to be aware that we cater to a diverse student population and a diverse parent slash caregiver population. So it's definitely something important. However, I would go further to look at possibly a committee to expand the role of the EDI committee to where we include academic excellence. Because at the end of the day, as a service entity and as an education entity, it's all about how do we remove the barriers of learning by making sure that all kids are excelling academically, that they can graduate from high school and have a career ready job. That's how we re remove disparity. When we don't look at the name calling and the labeling and the he said, she said, but we look at how do we build academic centers of excellence? That's the greatest way to remove disparity and to increase upward mobility for our citizens, for our students and for our, our adult population that send their kids to our schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Poteet, you have a minute and a half. Yes, ma'am. Um, so one thing I, I would say that I'm impressed with the district and Dr. Stone and the current board is that, you know, we, we've seen diversity, a change in the demographics of this district, um, a wholesale change in the last probably 15 to 20 years. I know for a fact, 30 years. Um, and so it was always gonna be something that was very important to the district. But what I've seen in the last four years, three years, has been action. Um, the board and Dr. Stone have set up this division within the administration. Um, they've adopted a policy. And then more recently, um, they set up the uh, Racial Equity Committee. 
So I think the that it shows that it's not just words, there's actions involved. Obviously, the emphasis uh, was ramped up over this last year with some of the social issues that have happened nationwide and within the district. And I think that we now have a structure where we can tackle some of those issues and come up with plans um, to address them. But back to what I said early on, and, and kind of Eric touched on this, was we've got to build a culture, and we've got to build a culture of success, which is focused on education. And if we don't have these kind of structures in place that are removing barriers um, to that culture and removing barriers ahead of those students and teachers where they don't feel comfortable coming and learning, then I think that, uh, that, we're, that we're treading water and we're doing a disservice. So I, I like the actions we've taken. I think they need to be continued. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stingle, you'll be first with this next question. Do you support the RISD bond package? That's propositions A and B. Based on your review and understanding, what would you have liked to see in the bond that is not there? And what should have been left out of the bond? You have a minute and a half. Well, I'm going to basically paint a picture. Of, it's kind of like a kid who goes to a toy store or a candy store. And I mean, I kind of wish we had more money for the bond. I mean, is it a lot of money? Yeah. So uh, our schools have aged infrastructure. So I'm for, for Proposition A. I'm all for revamping our school campuses. The, the alternative is if we don't pass it, we close our schools or we lay teachers off, which, you know, as a district, we traditionally haven't done. And the the proposition B, the, the uh, technology proposition, I'm for it. I'm a little hesitant about it. I think we need some good IT staff that it's kind of like, okay, here's a computer, here's some technology, good luck using it, but we don't have the staff to help tell you how to use it. So I do have that hesitancy, but you know, it, at the end of the day, it's all going to be up to the voters. Um, we, so that, that's my comment. I mean, it's going to be up to the voters. So um, yeah, I'm in favor of both of them with a degree of hesitancy for Proposition B. Thank you. Mr. Petit, you have a minute and a half. So do I support the bond? Well, as a member of the bond steering committee that voted to pass this, I would, uh, I would say yes, I absolutely support the bond. Um, my, my opinion of this bond is that there is nothing quite controversial like like past bonds. Um, I think that everything, unfortunately, we're in a landscape where uh, school finance and the way that the state appropriates that, we're forced into looking at bond measures um, to pay for big ticket items and capital expenditures like, um, like rebuilding a school or redoing air conditionings at a school. When you look at our budget of 368 million operating budget or so, 90 something percent of it is paying for the people within the district of which only I think two and a half percent is administration at the top, but the majority of it's teachers. So we don't have the capacity to tackle the problems like a school that's fallen apart, um, like Lake Highlands junior high without having the bond there. Um, it also follows with a strategic plan. I mean, we have a very good strategic approach to this five year bond cycle. And we're in a financial, we've managed uh, the district in such a financial way that we have the capacity to do this. And we typically pay these bonds off early and we compete uh, for very generous rates. So, so I think that this bond, I'm in full support. I don't see anything that should have been on there right now. I mean, there's tons of needs, but I think it's a good bond. I don't see anything that should have been dropped. Thank you. You bet. And Mr. LaGrasa, you have a minute and a half. I fully support um, of the bond measure. Uh, I think everything in there, uh, everything listed is valid and necessary. Um, like, like Christopher said, uh, I, I believe it's, you know, um, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, state funding and using uh, these kinds of bond measures for capital expenditures or even school, uh, school repair, you know, that, that gets into more of a, a technical matter uh, that, that uh, doesn't really have um, uh isn't isn't that kind of discussion isn't warranted today um whether or not uh we we need the info or whether or not the the concept of a, of a bond system isn't isn't necessary isn't a necessary conversation this bond needs to pass um if, if we are going to to have the kind of schools that compete 
on a uh, on a on a state level, on a national level, uh, we need to we need to move forward with this. Um, as far as Prop B with the technology, you know, I, I like what Eric said. Uh, definitely, more training needs to needs to be um, made available to to teachers. That way, we're not just handing them um, a bunch of technology that they don't know how to use. Um, I think we've all seen over the past year what happens when you give a bunch of people Zoom that uh, that they they don't know how to use. Um, I, I would like to see more funding put into the technology, especially as we move forward and, and talk about using uh, technology uh, as bridging the gap post COVID. Thank you. Thank you. This will be our last question and Mr. Petit, you will be the first to answer. This election completes the transition from all trustees being elected at large to the 5-2 system of five trustees elected in a single member district and two trustees elected at large. Uh, there are concerns that trustees elected from single member districts may advocate only for those people in their single member district and not for the RISD as a whole. Do you think the new system will affect the functioning of the board? How will representing the RISD as a whole shape your policy decisions? A minute and a half. Sure. So I definitely, I understand the transition. Um, I like the, uh, I like where it's, where it's ended up and will end up after May. Um, but I do, I think that it's just, it, we have to be open to the possibility that that could cause um, some, some of that, that type of human nature where there's going to be a tug of war between um, some single member uh, trustees having to, having to answer to the constituents within their single member district, but also keep a focus on the district at large. So that's going to be a challenge, I think, as we go forward. It's not here yet. We're too premature into it and we haven't completed that transition. But I think that we need to mitigate that. I think we need to know that that possibility is there. Um, we just need to look south to DISD and see what some of that causes. Um, but I think my role as a at-large trustee is, I think an added role there uh, outside of the five typical roles is there's an opportunity for me to help bridge those single member district trustees and their interests. I have to look at the district as a whole along with the other trustee, um, Eric, right now. But that's something that we can play that role and help help close those divides and bring the other single member district trustees together so that we keep that focus on the district at large. So I, I welcome that. I think um, we are where we're at, but I think that there's opportunities there to to mitigate any risk that we have in the future. And we're a part of it. Mr. LaGrasa, you have a minute and a half. I love the concept that we're moving to with 5-2. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's going to definitely benefit everyone um, to have that ex that the two extra um, trustees to to meet their needs. If for whatever reason they they can't uh, go to their their uh, district um, trustee, uh, I think I, I see at, uh, I see whoever uh, fills this role uh, almost as as a referee. Uh, okay, you got five people who want projects in their five districts. Um, me or whoever becomes the 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 other um, trustee for the at large, you know, our ourself and and the other trustee, you know, we have the chance to to sit down with each one of them and just and figure out how how best we can meet all needs versus on with 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 those particular projects. Uh, compromise and conversation aren't dirty words to me. Um, if, if that's what it's going to take to, to move the district forward, um, then, then absolutely uh, those of us uh, at large uh, need to be willing to sit down and, and make, uh, make good things happen. Um, if, if we feel that, um, if, if someone feels that a, that a, a, a district member is, is favoring their district more, more than everybody else, um, maybe, maybe we as a board have that conversation when that comes up, but until then, um, you know, we'll get there when we get there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stengel, a minute and a half. Uh, former board of trustee member David Tyson was a visionary. Uh, I'm definitely for the, the makeup of the board with the five, two split place, uh, that large position as well as uh, trustee Ager's position. It, it's a busy position. It represents the totality of the district. However, even if things would not have changed, I don't really see a shelter like a little cave atmosphere to where one trustee basically says, I'm only 
going to represent my area. I see the current board as a good team uh, that addresses all the schools. And I think that when a person runs for the school board, they not only run for their area, but they run for the whole district because a district is only as good as its many parts in its many schools and no board of trustee member, regardless of what place they represent, wants to have that bad mark on their record to where, oh, that school halfway across town, that's no good. Or that school, yeah, well, look at that school. No, I mean, that's not why we run for such a, a service position. That's three years unpaid. I mean, we all have the heart to make sure that all of our schools succeed. So, I, you know, that's my position. Thank you. That was the last question. Thank all three of you very much. This has been very informative. We'll now do closing statements. Uh, closing statements will be given in reverse ballot order. Each candidate will now have two minutes for a closing statement. And Mr. LaGrasa, we'll begin with you. I'm not the usual kind of person that runs for these seats. Um, you know, I'm young. I'm different. I think different. I act differently. You know, I'm, I'm more of a fan of move fast and break things. Um, I don't, uh, I, I don't trend towards tradition in the sense that, you know, my generation is, is, is going to be different. Let's make things different now. Um, bottom line, um, you know, I, 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 I do want to do, uh, what's right, what's, what's right and what's best for, for our kids. Um, I, you know, you don't need to be a parent, um, to, to, to see, uh, that, that may be moving in the direction we've moving in education wise, culture wise, socially wise for the past um, several decades, maybe isn't in the best direction. So let's uh, do something different. Uh, let's move forward. Let's, uh, let's be better than we were. Let's have a better education than we grew up with, than our parents grew up with, that our grandparents grew up with. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you want to vote for me, vote for me, if you want, if you want to see uh, something like that, um, and if not, I'll still be here. Uh, I'll be raising hell with these people one way or another, uh, making sure that, that uh, our, our kids um, have the best opportunity to receive the best education. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Petit, you have two minutes. All right. <clears throat> so again, I, just to kind of, from the intro statement, um, you know, I've, I've been, I see this as a great opportunity to serve my community. I see the success of our community in the future tying directly back to the quality of education that we give to our students. Um, I saw that, I, you know, I, I know that beyond just education, our neighborhoods benefit from that great education and schools, our uh, region does, and, um, and our state as a whole. So this is important, and it's especially important to these kids. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of solving problems. Uh, my years of service to the Lake Highlands community and RSD as a whole includes a lot of work over the last four years with Richardson ISD um, and specifically with, uh, with the current trustees, done a lot of work with them on committees. Um, within the Exchange Club of Lake Highlands, uh, the Dallas Landmark Commission, the Dallas Regional Chamber and Leadership Dallas, these are things that, that are resume, they're on a resume, but I think more importantly, they give me a a pool and a platform to reach back to community, to engage them as part of the role of the trustee. So those things are reason, not to mention I have two children in the district and I'm a stakeholder, but those are reasons that I wanna be part of the solutions going forward and be a part of the success and building this reputation of this district. Um, culture, I talk a lot about culture and I come from a lot of cultural uh, strong backgrounds um, we, need to, we need to embrace this culture. We need to build this culture. We need to make this a place where students achieve and teachers want to be. And I think we've got the structure in place to do it. We've got good leaders in place. We've got a good administration in place. And we've got strategic planning and stakeholder involvement, things that really, things that really resonate with me through my work, through my background, and through my everyday life. These are things that I think we can use to build this culture as we go forward. Thank you. You bet. Hey, Mr. Stengel, you have two minutes. Okay. Well, um, once a teacher, always a teacher. While I don't teach as a profession anymore, I do keep myself fresh. I, I'm a Sunday school teacher, but most importantly, I'm a teacher to my young daughter who's a first grader about to enter the second grade. And she's like, Daddy, 
what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a medical staff professional, you know, not very interesting, but I've always had a heart and passion. And part of the reason I'm running is to be a servant leader to the district. And if the voters don't choose to vote for me, then, you know, I'll probably serve on a committee or something of that nature. So uh, basically I wanna, you know, I wanna give back to the district that gave me so much. I received a stellar education as an RISD graduate. Uh, and then from, you know, the different educators that I encountered throughout my journey and still encounter today. I mean, you know, we're all educators. And so the board of trustees position is a very important valued position because education is the key to student success. And that's why I'm running. And I just want to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Ellen and Pamela, for hosting this and, and um, you know, go vote. So, <laughs> um, Many thanks to the candidates for participating in our um, virtual forum. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, every voting, excuse me, early voting in person begins Monday, April 19th and continues through Tuesday, April 27th. You must have already registered to, in order to vote in the May 1st joint election. The deadline to register to vote was April 1st. Remember, this forum was for candidates running in at-large place seven, ballot positions four through seven only. To see the candidates running in ballot positions one through three, see the other League of Women Voters of Richardson's place seven forum. Make sure you exercise your right to vote and thank you very much for watching. <laughs>